All right, welcome to lecture six, namespaces in XML, uh, SVG, and XSLFO. So before we forge ahead with anything new, why don't we take a quick look back at XSLT as an exercise in getting warmed up. There's a heck of a lot of stuff last week, and we pushed a little harder on some of the features of XSLT. Uh, so wow, let's see. Let's not review all of these, certainly, but uh, RTF. That's an interesting one, uh, if only because it's something you might trip over unintentionally when coding something up in XSLT. What are those? I sort of wonder what we did the previous week to muster these kinds of responses, but hopefully you're retaining something. Yeah? yeah? Results refragment? Yeah. That's what, it's, that's what it stands for? <laughs> <laughs> I got that in my room. Yeah. Um, and node set from within variables? Okay, so sort of. It's not a node set, actually, which is the primary distinction to make, but it certainly arose in the context of variables. We saw these things in the context of doing something like this. If we said XSL colon variable. And then in there, for instance, did something like foo, and then a nested bar, and then close foo. What data type did this give us in the variable that I will call, my apologies for my bad handwriting with this chalk, equals var. So what does that store in var? <sighs> String, OK, so a string. So if we wanted to actually manipulate this thing and actually access, for instance, the bar element, could we do it by saying something like dollar sign var slash foo slash bar? OK, no. So I mean, that was sort of the catch. Even if we had these what um, aesthetically look like nested XML structures within a variable or even within a parameter, they're not actually these navigable data structures. Um, there are ways of converting this. So we mentioned extension functions last time. And actually, I would urge you, especially when it comes time to write your own projects in XSLT, whether it's for the final project or just beyond the course, to look up what extension functions you have accessible to you. Zalin, for instance, provides a node set function that can actually take what's effectively a string and convert it into what you conceptually hope is, in fact, some kind of uh, mem in-memory object, namely a foo object with a bar child in this context. Uh, let's pluck off something else from here. Uh, so iteration we've seen before, patterns and modes and these kinds of things. So one of the themes that ended up getting laced throughout last week's lecture was this idea of push versus pull. And this isn't necessarily a formal distinction. This is just jargon we can apply to sort of two different mental models. What did we mean, though, by these arbitrary distinctions of calling a, t uh, a style sheet a push-oriented one versus a pull-oriented one? Yeah, again, and this isn't necessarily a formal concept, but in the style sheets that we described with this concept of pull, we were typically more iterative. We would match on the root of the document with forward slash, and then we would sort of pull the data out that we wanted using things like for each and value of. Whereas the more sophisticated approach, and dare say the truer approach to XSLT, we sort of saw more so toward the end of last lecture, which was the so-called push approach, where you sort of push your data through all of these different templates that just match the disparate nodes. And it was that sort of level of sophistication that I sort of challenged you to aspire to, only because the first time you tackle this stuff, it's not necessarily, I think, straightforward to code things up in that way. But you can do some really neat things, and it becomes a very powerful tool when you're, you're comfortable expressing yourself in that sort of approach. And recall that perhaps the most poignant example you saw last week was this paring down of the problem of attribute converter from version 1 to 2 to 3, whereby the third version, I think we had whittled the problem down to maybe four lines or six lines of XSLT, expressing the entirety of the program very succinctly in that 
that regard. So again, the point is not to say that the end game at the end of, the end game should be minimization of code, but just to illustrate how just how expressive this stuff is. Yeah. Sure, again, and these are informal distinctions we're making here. I wouldn't exit the class preaching to folks that you've just learned the pull versus push method, um, but we're doing it, I'm doing it just to sort of draw a line between these two approaches. But yeah, there you, I mean, at the end of the day, you're still using the same language, and there's nothing that you could do with one that you couldn't do with the other, and vice versa. It's, different, it's a different mental model, a different uh, angle of attacking a problem is all. Could be, absolutely could be a difference in terms of performance. Uh, it depends. So does, is for each faster than simply calling apply templates? Both can have inefficiencies. It depends on how you're grabbing the data. Apply templates, for instance, by default applies all possible templates to all possible children by default. But if you narrow the application of apply templates to just a subset of nodes, arguably you could be touching far fewer in that way. So the short answer is it depends. And the true answer would be to just think through your own code and count up how many nodes are actually getting touched, how many different recursions are happening, or how many different iterations are happening. Yeah? Mm. Our, the relationship between keys and templates. Uh, in short, no. So taking advantage of keys, and if you haven't taken a look at this particular feature of XSLT, pull up uh, the W3Schools website, wonderful resource, and just look up the XSL key element. Essentially, what that allows you to do is pre-declare a, a hash table of sorts, which allows you to expedite lookups of data because you can sort of pre-declare access to various parts of your document so that the processor only has to retrieve that data once and then it effectively tucks it away in, in the equivalent of a linked list or a hash table so that it's not constantly retraversing a, uh, an XML tree unnecessarily. Um, but it's conceptually and implementation wise very distinct from the idea of invoking a template. That's really just about fetching data and caching it for later use. So it's memory intensive. It was what memory intensive? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the idea of a key, keys are useful if you reuse them, right? If you're just doing it once, there's no point. But if you, for instance, with my Blockbuster and Xtube, both of which presumably you'll be wanting to execute similar queries both times, if you are each time using just a very large location path, the implication is that the processor is going to have to traverse the entire tree step by step by step to get where you want it to be, unless you can factor out some common subset of a location path and toss it in a key so that it effectively remembers that data somehow, remembers the node set that it's been matched. So again, in short, if you haven't sort of stumbled across this, or if you're hoping to whittle away some of your running time for your current project too, by all means, just check out um, XSL Key in particular, and W3School's website is perfect little tutorial on it. It's not all that hard. Okay. Okay. So today is all about three major topics. One, namespaces, which we actually get out of the way quite quickly. We just introduce it more formally now because you're going to see namespaces in use all over the place because we're finally now intermingling even more so various different variants of XML. And we need a way of distinguishing them within a document and namespaces are going to be the way to do that. SVG is pretty cool in that it's an XML based uh, language for expressing polygons and lines and shapes and whatnot. And it certainly has its utility in some contexts. We'll be using it in Project 2 to dynamically generate a map, recall, of Project 2's Xtube data so that you get a geographically true uh, representation. It's nice because there exist tools like uh, Batik or Batik. I'm not positive how it's supposed to be pronounced, but it's a, it's a rasterizer that allows you to take SVG and generate a ping or a JPEG or a PDF, which is a useful thing when you don't want your, for instance, your users to have to have an SVG viewer, which is not a very commonly installed plugin, but rather you want them to look at something else. So that's a useful transformation to make. And XSLFO 
it's kind of scary, I think, even to me. There's a real, it's sort of like, as I said last week, to me it feels like learning a bit of postscript, um, simply to express yourself in a typesetting mindset. What we'll do really is scratch the surface of it and give you enough of a foundation in it so that you can use it to generate PDFs, to generate structured PDFs with tables and whatnot, and we'll make that more real with projects three and or four when you actually use it to generate the equivalent of receipts in PDF format, because that's actually a useful tool to be able to have. Um, and finally, we'll look at the remainder of project two tonight, namely the SVG and FO components. All right, so namespaces have pretty much been around since XML itself. Um, they're familiar, they're similar in concept to namespaces in other languages, SC++, uh, packages in Java. It's that kind of idea so that you can distinguish uh, one piece of data from another piece of data or functionality from another piece of data. How do you declare a namespace? Well, the useful things to know are as follows. Anytime you've seen something like something followed by a colon, followed by a tag name, we've seen a namespace prefix in use. So what's this all about? Well, here we have an arbitrary document, the root element of which is called what? So it is, in, in fact, called foo. But because foo is prefixed with CSEI 259 colon, what that means is that foo is in whatever namespace is implied by the CSEI 259 prefix. Well, what is that? Well, we have to look a bit further to the XMLNS colon prefix uh, I, uh, attribute, look at its value, and it appears that that long URL there, HTTP and so forth, is the identifier for the namespace that internally is going to be referred to by the prefix CSCI259. Okay, so what does that all mean? So think of this as putting the foo element in the E259 package conceptually, or the E259 namespace. The convention in the world is to use URLs, or more generally a URI, to uniquely identify one's namespace. The re reason for that is that presumably domains are only owned by individual people. Or presumably, if you use a domain name, presumably you're the only one with physical access to that machine or that URL. The idea being that the goal of namespaces is for everyone in the world who wants to create a namespace for themselves to choose a unique string. Well, what better way than to just choose something like a URL, which because of our whole DNS infrastructure is already guaranteed to be unique if you're the owner. So even though this thing looks like a URL, that doesn't mean there's anything at that address. It's completely arbitrary. But we chose, in the spirit of this arbitrariness, um, a path to our website followed by slash namespace, just so that we can bet that no one else in the world is going to bother choosing a string like this to uniquely identify their namespace. Uh, finally, and we'll motivate this in reverse direction in just a moment, the next element there, bar, is actually kind of interesting in that it doesn't have what? So it doesn't appear to have a prefix, and in turn, it doesn't seem to have a namespace associated with it. So is it, in fact, the bar element in a namespace? OK, yeah, so it's in the so-called default namespace. So if a node's namespace is not specified explicitly, for instance, with a prefix, it's in the default namespace, which is represented by the empty string. OK? Oogle, by contrast, is or is not in a namespace? Is, but which one? The default namespace, again, because it's not prefixed. But Fugl, the attribute, obviously, is in that namespace. So now let's ask the more important question, who cares about all of this? Why this complexity? Well, the point of names, among the points of namespaces are to allow a program that's parsing an XML document to distinguish between what data should be par processed by it versus what data should be processed by another program. So consider XSLT. What two languages have we been intermingling quite a bit thus far with XSLT documents? HTML, HTML right? And both are tag-based languages. And no, recall a typical XSLT document we've whipped up before, or you've been doing for project two, which of the tags in that document has the prefixes before each element's name? Yeah, so thus far, for the most part, the habit I've gotten into myself, at least, is to prefix the XSL elements with XSL colon, thereby distinguishing them from, say, open bracket, 
B, close bracket for the bold tag, or the open bracket H1, close bracket for the H1 tag. And if we look closely, as we can in just a moment, at one of those style sheets, you'll find that the reason we were using that prefix was to essentially tell Zalin what it should process and what it should ignore as not being meant for it. So even though this example here is somewhat arbitrary, one of the roles of namespaces, or the primary role of namespaces, is to sort of associate a piece of metadata, processing information, with a node, or rather an element and or attribute, so that whoever's reading this document knows that it belongs to him or not. Well, let's actually take a look at myblockbuster.xsl, since that's presumably a file that you've been spending some time with. So in myblockbuster.xsl, we've had this file. Okay, This is the default one, which had a big old to-do in the middle. But now let's tease some of these things apart. And there's a few distractions in here, because there's more going on than just related to namespaces. But here we have the so-called what at the top. First line. Uh, not quite. It looks like one, but it's the so-called XML declaration. So one point at uh, Trivia Night at your local bar. It's the XML declaration, even though it looks like a PI. Okay, Unfortunate coincidence. This is just a comment, obviously. This thing here is more generally, in any XML document, known as the... OK, I'll take that. I was looking for root elements, but I'll give you credit for um, style sheet declaration as well. So this is just the root element, though, of the document. And this here, of course, is an XML document. Let me, um, I don't think we can manually adjust the screen. So let me shrink the window so that part of it is not cut off like that. OK. OK, so now let's dive in deeper here. So We'll ignore this, this, and now let's get to, let's ignore that one too. Let's get to this one. So here again is that special identifier XML NS. And even though it here looks like a prefix, it's a special prefix. It's with the XML NS um, attribute effectively that you can specify prefixes for namespaces. And what's a namespace? Well, it's that which is uniquely identified by some string. OK, so what does that mean? Well, hereby, with this line, XSL colon is hereby associated with the namespace that's identifiable by this unique string. OK, what does that mean? Well, we obviously have seen the, throughout the rest of this document, including the root element, XSL colon prefixes, almost all of the tags in this document, hard-coded by the folks at Apache into the program we know as Zalin is somewhere this string. And what they have done at Apache is to say, whenever you encounter an element that is in this namespace, whatever its prefix is, process it as though it were XSLT 1.0. Okay, if I so much as change this thing to look like this, oops, slight typo, presumably Zalin should choke and it won't recognize anything in this document because it's looking for that string. However, I could do this. I could change this to be completely silly to foo, and then I could change every instance of XSL colon to foo, and Zalin should have no problem with this because the prefix is arbitrary. I can go one step further. You can override what the so-called default namespace is by not specifying something after the colon. So if I took this one step further and just got rid of this, thereby implying that the default namespace for all elements in this document is the following, that string. Well, now I can go through and get rid of all of those prefixes to my XSL elements. So now notice it's just open bracket style sheet, open bracket output, open bracket template. Unfortunately, I just broke everything, though. Why? Right, so now we have these HTML tags, which are similarly lacking prefixes, but the implication is that what? Now they're in the XSL namespace, which is not the case. So now if we ran this thing through Zalin, it should choke saying, I don't know what the HTML element is. I don't know what the head element is. So we could go back, and we could actually look up what the namespace is for XSLT one point, uh, for XHTML 1.0, and we could say something like XML and S colon uh, HTM equals whatever that namespace is at the W3C site. And I'm not, I don't recall it offhand, the full path. 
And then we could go through, and we'd have to, in this case, manually say htm, 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 and so forth. So which approach you take is really rather arbitrary. I would say the convention, though, tends to be the approach we've taken in all of our examples thus far. Let the HTML get output raw in the fashion you're already familiar with, but then use prefixes for things like XSL. Yeah. And then here, and then here. Um, okay. Suppose going back to your example where you created a, a CSCI uh, mm -hmm. 259. And I mean, suppose, and, and you're, su suppose that you, you were in process enough and you just said, okay, the, the URI is what it is and that's unique, but I'm just going to call it Harvard. Okay. And then somebody else comes along with, with the whole another XML package. Mm -hmm. also Good question. How do you, how do you reconcile that? So good question. So to summarize for the camera, suppose that two people choose the same unique identifier for a namespace. Uh, in short, you would run into significant problems using those two people's code together because you would presumably be using either your processor for that namespace or their processor, both of which presumably are going to choke on the other guy's code. Um, is there a clean way to resolve that? Not really. I think the only elegant solution would be to slap on another a distinct prefix, for instance, and then support another namespace, which is why the world has sort of adopted this approach to try to avoid that. I mean, this is why in the world of Java, folks has even use domain names there. So the company called Foo might use com.foo.classes. Etc. for its package names for exactly that reason. The idea being no one else in the world is going to choose that kind of system. Oh, the, the prefix. Oh, OK. So that's a different story. That is surmountable. If I and my, so suppose the context is I'm a developer and I've just downloaded your style sheet, which in effect is a library. And we, for instance, cited last week a library of XSL functions that's linked on our own software page. If you just happen to use that prefix throughout, that's not a big deal because you, in your own code, I mean, one, you could just, these things are text files. So you could just replace the prefix identifier. You have control over your own code. You could just change your prefix identifier. Um, I mean, that would be the simplest approach. Um, you probably would have to change it. Um, but I would say in general, I mean, the fact of the matter is you don't, I don't think you would see that happening all that often anyway. It's, we're just not combining different people's style sheets all that terribly often without already some standard in place like XSL colon. For schema, we'll see XSD or XS colon. For SVG, we'll see SVG colon. And for the most part, um, for the most part, that's a very a find and replace can resolve that issue. The other issue is much harder if the namespace is the same. Okay, uh, most likely yes. So to summarize, suppose that two people did choose the same namespace unique strings, uh, but they never used, uh, but there's no collision of the elements in the two different namespaces. Odds are there still would be a problem, but it depends on the implementation of the processor. So for instance, suppose that I, just to be crazy, chose the same identifier as the folks over at the W3C have for what we know as XSLT. If I then um, supported a whole bunch of elements, foobar and baz, which obviously are not in the XSLT spec, but I fed my input document with those tags to XSL to Zalin, presumably Zalin should choke because Zalin's designed to process recursively all of the nodes in the Zalin, in the XSLT namespace. It's going to encounter three nodes, foobar and baz in my input document that I'm telling it are in that namespace. Zalin's going to say, no, they're not. I don't know what to do with this. It's an invalid document. So it comes back to the question of validity, right? So a processor for XSLT presumably is going to try to validate the document and make sure that all of the tags in it are actually legit. 
your processor, if you're a bit looser about these things or lazier as a developer, you might not check for validity. You might just make this leap of faith and if you encounter a tag you don't know about, skip it. And maybe that's a reasonable solution, but it depends on the language you're implementing. If it's XSLT, not such a good idea. If, you're, if it's your own XML-based language, then it's probably immaterial what you do. And we'll see more again about validity in a couple weeks' time. So, uh, yeah. So when you remove the XSL for the XSLT on the top, then when you get to the XHTML, you, you have another namespace decoration? You would. So you mean if we made the default namespace just, X, just that itself? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so then I would have to go look up the namespace identifier for XHTML, which I mentioned I didn't. Uh, And the H, oh yes, perfect, thank you. I didn't even see it there. So it is the, in fact there. Um, and actually, that's actually a good segue to another technique for doing this. So if we did in fact specify that the default namespace for this document where my cursor is blinking is just that string, I could then go ahead and start getting rid of things like this. Okay, because the also worthy of note is that when you have a namespace declared like this, it's valid for that element and all of its descendants. It's in scope for all of those nodes, which is to say that all of these nodes now by default, for instance, output are in the default namespace because they have no prefix. Well, that default namespace is now this thing because of the, ta the attribute that I've used. When now I get down to this, this overrides the default namespace, which effectively means that henceforth, every node without a prefix is now in this namespace. And that's actually a good thing because it solves this problem, but the implication or the problem arises here. If you so much as put one XSLT instruction here, like X uh, value of select equals something, the problem now is that the default namespace in that scope is what? XHTML, so now we've got a problem. So now, okay, we can fix this. How can we fix this? XML NS, and then I got to scroll back up, copy and paste XSLTs. I mean, this just does not scale very well, which is why the prefixes are so useful in the first place. So I think the rule of thumb, I mean, in reality, you tend not to mix more than one or two or three different XML languages within a document. I think you'd be hard pressed to find reasons to do even more than that. So in practice, usually using a prefix for all but one of them is just common practice. That's all. Good question, so. And that was actually a perfect segue to that idea of inheritance for the various nodes. And one point I'll note is that, as uh, just to be more precise, when you do have a default namespace, so for instance, if we didn't have this prefix here, it is again active for that node and all of its descendants, which is why we're sort of able to retroactively define the CSEI 259 prefix in the very node that we're using it. That is valid. That's OK to do. OK. All right. Um, oh, look at that. We already did that. OK. Any questions on namespace? It's not something that you need to be savvy with. It's just something you need to realize what's going on. And I think that'll help you distinguish or diagnose problems in the weeks to come if you encounter such. OK. All right. So SVG has been around for a few years. That's just a formal definition of it. Let's put this into context, make things more real. So here's an example of a bitmapped image. So most of you probably know that among the most popular file formats for graphics these days are GIFs, JPEGs, maybe kind of sort of pings, and various other ones. But though JPEGs and GIFs are really the biggies on the internet. Um, differences among them include the amount of colors each of them can display, but <laughs> Uh, which one's anima animated and such. But at the end of the day, both GIF and JPEG and even PNG are so called bitmapped file formats. At the end of the day, all they do, dot for dot for dot, is describe what should be in that dot, the color thereof, for instance. But they do it in different ways, some more algorithmically, some with compression, some without, and so forth. But the implication of anything that's bitmapped is that if we take a very pretty photograph and then zoom in on a very small piece of it, um, what you see is the pixelation. You see the actual dots. And that might be fine for a lot of contexts, but in others where precision is key, it would be really nice if we could express maybe more mathematically the curves and the lines and the shapes in that document so that we could scale this thing ad infinitum without actually losing any fidelity. So think about the world of desktop publishing and newspapers where they tend to use things like 
um, TIFFs or EPS images, if you're familiar, which scale without loss of quality because they're represented, they can be represented ultimately more mathematically with formula that just scale, um, literally by multiplying them by some factor. This is, uh, do we, uh, we'll do the silly little example, but uh, gives you an example of what you can do with vector graphics, which are distinct from bitmaps. So among our examples tonight and is this thing, which is one of these internet forwards I got years ago. All right, so the point of this exercise, beyond being silly for a moment, is that this is an example of shockwave flash, or flash that most of you, almost all of us have probably seen on various websites. Um, notice I've shrunk the window pretty small and things still look pretty good. If I make the thing even bigger, and I don't even have that high resolution with this projector, things look just as good. And I could continue to scale this thing again and again and again because what it is not is a bitmap. Instead, this flash is an example of a vector-based file format, or the vector there just implies that there are formulae underlying this file format that allow it to scale in the, um, without boundaries on its quality. So if I had a bigger screen, this thing would look just as good. The horses would simply look bigger. Okay, now in completely, now let's see, we don't have a, do we have an audio hookup here? If we're gonna make this more real. All right, let's see if this works. Completely gratuitous example before proceeding with SVG. Okay, volume. Yes, we have the acapella group that are these little horses. Okay, you can forward this to all your friends after class too if you want. Ah, I didn't get it right. Okay, there we go. Okay, we got to do it on the right note. Here we go. No. Close. It's kind of cute. I have no recollection of who made this, other than I think it was from someone in Sweden. But it actually has this very Harvard-esque feel, what with the two dozen a cappella groups here that are on campus. Anyhow, pass that along to your friends if you would like. But otherwise, it's just an example in a fun way of one of these vector-based file formats. Unfortunately, SVG is not as expressive, doesn't support sounds and the like, but it is in fact an example also of a uh, vector-based file format. So how do you display these things? Well, for something like those horses, you need Macromedia or now Adobe's Flash Player. Fortunately, it comes with most every browser today, so even though it's a plug-in within your browser, Pretty much everyone has it, so there's no concept anymore, really, of downloading it manually. SVG, not so common. Even I didn't have it on this laptop as of 20 minutes ago and had to install it before coming to class. It is free. You can get it from Adobe. We have a link on the course's website. But it's certainly not a very uh, commonly used file format, certainly with or a commonly used plugin within browsers, which is why in Problem Set 2 Spec, we point you in the direction of that Apache rasterizer so that you can actually convert SVG to something that's more common since it's typically impractical to expect your users to go and install special software just because you made a nice little image that you would like them to see. So fortunately there are very easy workarounds. But you can do some neat things with it. So this is an example, this is a screenshot of something I'll show you in a moment which is an example someone did um, using SVG for animation. So this is underground morph. Let me go ahead and go into our examples here. Uh, I think it's under SVG and underground morph. Let's see if it's going to play. Yep, it's playing. So this actually is neat in that it's very germane to problem set uh, to project two. So what you're seeing now is a handful of the London Underground, aka tubes, train lines, uh, currently represented geographically consistently. So once it pauses, that's what it really looks like in London from a bird's eye view. And now they did this morph into what, if you pick up the station map, Londoners tell you their subway system looks like. So the MBT is somewhat similar, although ours is more geographically consistent. But it's not the case that all these lines go you know, in a perfect rectangle right downtown in the hub. And then the red line goes like this and like this. That's just not quite how it works. London's even crazier in that they've simplified it. But there's quite a famous guy whose name I don't recall offhand who was actually responsible for years ago putting together with the crazy number of lines that London's tube has in a fairly 
actually readable format. So your SVG output ultimately will look like this with even more lines, but if you pick up the London map and if you look at the PDFs we've given you, you'll see things that look more like that. So, but it's a neat use of SVG nonetheless here. We won't focus on actual animation. This though, by contrast, is an example of a geographically consistent London map. Not with as many lines as we've given you, but just to give you a sense of what your output's gonna start to look like, it's more like this. Someone did this though with, I think, Adobe Illustrator, which is a graphic design program that allowed him to put together uh, this uh, representation but I believe they manually moved things like the station names around so that they wouldn't overlap. So I'll tell you now that your map, at the end of the day, I think it's very rewarding to actually see yourself generate a fairly huge transit system map, but it's gonna be messy and sloppy because it's really hard, if not impossible, to take the several hundred station names and line names and make sure none of them overlap and make sure they're all readable. You really need to exercise human judgment at that point. So yours is gonna look messier than this, but structurally it should look the same, albeit with more lines. Um, this one I thought we would just take things over to uh, more to the east. This is an example of just another approach to an underground map, also using SVG, and notice if you hold on a PC at least control and just click, we can zoom in on some of these things. And you'll notice even though this thing's pretty ugly, each time I zoomed in, we didn't lose any quality per se. All the lines and angles are still pretty sharp. If I zoom out now in uh, my browser, I get that. Let's see, if I right click, I can just say original view and it'll reset everything for us. But what this map has, which the other is different, is the, are these ideas of different colors for the lines still, but also circles to denote each of the stations. And so that's a slight uh, step in the direction of what we expect you to output. And we'll get to that point in just a moment, what we want yours to look like or what yours ideally should look like. But first, let's actually see what's going on underneath the hood. Here is perhaps, uh, among the simplest SVG documents that you can make. Okay, so what's the first line of this XML file called? It's not a PI? Okay, good. Easy questions. All right. Next thing is the doc type. So this is important, and this is one of those copy-paste jobs, unless you can actually remember these cryptic strings, which I cannot. Uh, so just realize that that it needs to be there in order to tell the processor, in this case Adobe's plugin, what kind of document it's looking at. All right, the root element in any SVG document is the SVG element. Arbitrarily, but by convention, I've chosen SVG colon as the prefix that I'm gonna use throughout. It's not a problem that this is identical, excuse me, to the name of the element itself. Not a problem there. And notice that I'm defining the namespace SVG prefix right here in the root element where it, belo where it usually belongs. There's an SVG text element, which quite simply is going to output text. So it's with this element that folks were able to output things like the station names there. And in fact, we'll see in a moment that you can even make hyperlinks out of them, especially since SVG can and tends perhaps to be displayed within a browser, which makes that useful. So let's pull up this example. It looks like it's going to create a block of text uh, filled with in red. Looks like its Y coordinate of some one of its pixels is going to be at 15, something or other, and then it's going to say this is SVG. So let's take a look. Uh, that was text.svg. Completely underwhelming. Yep. Oh, a little. Let me move it over. Okay. So perhaps the one thing you wouldn't typically use SVG for, at least independently, is to output text, since we have many other ways to do that. But it's certainly useful for labels, so we'll contextualize that in a moment. But let's move on to something a little more interesting, shapes. So shapes, notice that before, after. Really wasn't a huge leap to change what this thing is looking like. So we went from the text element, now to the rect, the rectangle element. To do this, I'm going to say style equals fill blue. Width of this thing is going to be 250 pixels. Height's going to be 100. And by default, presumably, it's going to be in the top left corner. So let's take a look at rect.svg. Wow, it's very, very sophisticated uh, graphics design here. But baby steps. Now, if we want to do more interesting things, we have the means of expressing more interesting shapes. Uh, each of which has various attributes. Um, I tried to pluck off some of the most um, 
common ones. I tried to cite resources too that should be useful tutorials that use sometimes the same examples and then also on our website under SVG you'll see other references as well but for the most part it doesn't take much to lay these things out. To have a circle we have CX and CY. Take a guess what those are implying. What do those attributes mean? Yeah, the center of x and uh, the center of the circle with respect to x and y, and then uh, r implying a radius. So that thing's going to have a diameter of 40 pixels around. Uh, it's going to be filled in red, and it's going to look like that thing on the right. We have an ellipse. We have lines. You have polygons that can be defined in terms of a few points, and then the last two get connected. Or you can have polyline, which literally goes from the space separated pairs of x y coordinates. A little sloppy, I think, that to do things this way, but it is a valid approach in some XML contexts. Uh, what this is implying here is that you should start drawing a line at 5, 5, which presumably is there. If we assume 0, 0 is in the top left of a document, as seems to be the case, then go to 45, 45, so that seems to be over here, then go back to 5, 45, then go to 45, 5. And that's why this thing got drawn like that, using, of course, red. Finally, a rectangle we saw earlier. Uh, this time, though, we've given it a bit of a rounded edge just by specifying the sort of um, uh, radius, I believe, is the implication for Rx and Ry, which gives us these slightly rounded edges, as though it's, there's a circle of radius 5 up there in the corner. Okay, so just an introduction to some of the different constructs that you can use here. All right, so, um, but now let's, let's take things up a notch, especially since what you're really going to be doing with Project 2 is not just drawing um, polygons and just drawing circles, but you're actually going to need to connect the dots, so to speak, and actually generate lines connecting with lines. So here's an example um, called path1.svg that uses the path element, and it does so using a syntax that I've taken an excerpt here to describe what a path is. So if you use SVG path, you can then have the D attribute be this cryptic looking sequence of instructions and coordinates and distances. Well, what do you need to know? M is the move to command, set a new current point. L is the line to command, that is draw a straight line. Curve to, uh, arc, close path, that is actually connect the first and last dots. And so what we have here is the instruction move to pixel location 50 comma 100 so x equals 50 y equals sorry 10 not 100 l so draw a line from there to this coordinate then draw a line to this coordinate and then z means close it off fill in the rest of the gap there so let's see what this thing looks like path one a little more involved than the others okay so what we really have there is a triangle we've Oh, so the Z. So let's, let's follow this here. So move to 50, 10. So that's moving us over 50 and down 10, which puts us at that coordinate. Uh, the next thing we had was draw a line to 350, 10, which draws from there to there. And then finally, we had draw a line to 21, uh, tw 200, 120, which brings us here. And then I just said Z which means essentially connect this dot with that dot, close off the path, okay. sort of in a Photoshop sense with the lasso tool, if you're familiar, where it just closes the path you opened. All right, let's do this slightly differently now. So in this example here, let's spoil the result first, in path2.svg, and you do have printouts of all these examples too among tonight's second handout. So here we have a curved arc of sorts. How is this being done? Well, this time our paths, the attribute, says move here, and then effectively draw a curve using um, cubic Bezier uh, curve. So essentially some mathematics to give you this curved uh, relationship uh, using this coordinate to this coordinate to this coordinate. And you don't have to feel totally savvy with these kinds of instructions. Looking online at, for instance, one of the resource might give you additional examples to get a sense from, but essentially what we did with that instruction is we specified essentially the coordinates of a box and then using that C command did it figure out that essentially it doesn't want to make a box out of that, but it sort of wants to draw the line as though there are magnets at each of the corner. It's pulling the pencil, so to speak, in that direction, but, or gravity might be another way to think about it so that the thing actually comes out curved 
and not as straight lines. So again, just a little tool to keep in mind. Um, but fortunately, with Project 2, what we really ultimately are getting at are things that are going to look like this. So we'll get there in just a moment. But first, anchors. So we promised that there's a way to hyperlink from one place to another. It's pretty simple, actually. And this is a foreshadow of a language um, that we'll look at in before long using the anchor tag in SVG, using the hrefs, href attribute, but using this prefix, or really this namespace, can you specify the URL that that uh, link should hyperreference? So let's see this in action. This is anchor.svg, also among tonight's examples, anchor. This is just that text example again, but notice if I click this thing, do I actually get a, no. Let's try that again. Oh, interesting. OK, so I think IE7 is blocking this thing from triggering the pop-up. So OK, it used to work in IE6. OK, so just know that in theory that could work. But I think the browser is interfering with what I want to do. Uh, let's just assume that that worked, because what it did was it associated this piece of text, this is CSE IE259, with that particular URL. And I mention Xlink now, because notice that uh, the folks over at SVG's working group could have defined an href attribute for SVG, but they didn't. They instead borrowed the spec for the href attribute from a recommendation called xlink, XML links. And essentially, there are so many different languages based in XML that want to be able to express the idea of a hyperlink. The W3C essentially tried to standardize the format for expressing a hyperlink. That language is known as xlink. And so SVG just leverages that uh, piece of implementation detail to use in their own language, rather than in defining their own. So useful when it comes to borrowing off-the-shelf software to process those hyperlinks. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, the A is part of SVG. The href is borrowed from Xlink. So SVG has the, the A. Okay. Yes. For now, uh, take it on faith. For now, and when we get when we look at Xlink, I'll try to make it more clear. But for now, it's just a. Uh, we you will not see many examples of this. This, in fact, is the only one that comes to mind right now. Yeah. Oh, this is sort of like an HTML thing, actually. Um, so target equals blank means open up this link in a new window. This is a name for the window. And underscore blank is the token that means open a new one. So you see that in HTML, next HTML. OK, so finally, and this might prove useful in project two, because clearly you're going to be generating a lot of lines and a lot of circles. It would be nice to have some notion of reusable code. You can do that in SVG using what are called definitions. Uh, so we can define, for instance, with the defs tag here, a rectangle, henceforth, which will be called I rect, whose width is 15, height is 15, fill is red. And then any time I want to essentially spit out a rectangle that looks like that, you can just use that ID and put it at these coordinates. So that's a way for you, for instance, to define what a circle looks like for a station, for instance, and just reuse that again and again rather than copying and pasting this, because at least then you can change what it looks like, the color, for instance, in one place, and not have to do a find and replace and replace the whole document, which perhaps might be valuable. Ah, so um, motivate the pound sign. So yes, so there is a pre-existing convention in HTML, on XHTML, for these things known as fragment IDs, which allow you to, but even there we're sort of mixing metaphors, because you link to those by way of name uh, attributes. Um, in short, this is not an uncommon way of referencing a location within a document by way of its name, or in this case, ID. Um, and the sharp symbol is simply a means of saying that it's uh, is suggesting that this token, rect, refers to something within the document rather than something external, like a URL or a file. 
All right, so this is sort of a spoiler. In circle.svg, have I actually implemented the tube's circle line? I took out the data for the various stops on this line. I borrowed the exact color code for this line. And in circle SVG, you have an example of SVG, hopefully pretty readable, that ex explains. Oh, and you'll notice the default size of this thing. I took it out of context to our, from our solution, essentially. So the surrounding this thing was the rest of London's tube, but I factored out just the uh, circle line stuff. So let's zoom in on this. And here we have what you saw a moment ago. If we view the source of this thing, as you can do with so you should be able to do with Adobe's Viewer. OK, i.e., not cooperating it again. So let's save this file. Well, let's just, can I open it here? OK, let's go into the examples directory, uh, SVG, and open up Circle. OK, so inside of Circle, and you'll see a lot of redundancy, because even this I generated with XSLT just using a template or two. At the top, we've got our XML declaration, then our doc type declaration, then our SVG root element. But what appears to be missing thus far? Yeah, the namespace, or really the prefix. And uh, yeah, let's say in public, then the doc type. Yeah, so it appears that. Um, so because we're not trying to distinguish one namespace from another within this document, because it's all SVG, um, and we're running it through ultimately an SVG processor, I've gotten away with omitting the namespace uh, prefix and namespace identifier altogether. But I have included the so-called doc type definition. This is a common approach in XHTML or HTML as well, where you need to provide the doc type if you want to deem your code valid. But you don't necessarily need the HTML namespace information there, because the processor just assumes that the doc type, by its, nat by its presence, defines what entirely is in this document. But what do we have in here? Well, G is this, uh, think of it as the analog and SVG of the div element in XHTML. It's a group of stuff. Uh, so this thing is going to, hence everything here is going to have a stroke width of one. So that's, a, a, um, say, a pixel width. And then we have this group called line three. And inside here looks like a group. The style is going to be in this color, this width. And then I'm drawing a line from x1, y1 to x2, y2. So that's one of the yellow lines that's in my map of the circle line, which again looked like this, uh, which again looked like this. OK, so that's one of the segments between two stations. And then very out of context, this looks rather boring to look at. But each of these coordinates was drawn from x, uh, x2 excuse me, dot XML and dynamically outputted. If we scroll all the way to the bottom, now we'll see the circles that I defined. I put the circles at the bottom of the file so that they would overlay any of the lines so that they wouldn't be hidden. And then here, too, I have the titles of these circles listed, uh, the center X and the center Y coordinates, and the radius being pretty small at 1. And I have that for all of the stations there. And then finally, and again, this um, to be clear, the title isn't actually what's displayed. You can think of that more in the spirit of the alt attribute in web pages. But when I actually want to use text, we have to go back to the text example. And here, using a small mathematical formula that's not guaranteed to be perfect and avoid overlaying of text, which you don't have to worry about for the project too. Um, I've simply specified where I want each of these text locations to be and what I want the text to be, which is why these stations ultimately also have labels physically apparent. And here's the kind of messiness that you should expect and you should be OK with in your own implementations, because really only a human could fix that or a language more expressive than SVG itself if you actually had to compute distances, for instance, from one text to another. Yeah. Isolate, oh, what to say again? One of the coordinates, the y, it has a 14 point number. Oh, um, is that OK? So is that invalid, actually? No, I've seen that elsewhere. So I don't think there's a problem with that. And it is a function of my XSLT's output. But I believe that is fine. Actually, so that should be fine, because again, we're talking about vector scaling anyway. So we should be able to specify that amount of precision if we want. We don't have to rely on pixel boundaries. In the other thing, 
repeating the font name? Is there something like CSS for SVG? Yeah. Um, so, so yes, essentially. Essentially, a lot of stuff has been borrowed from CSS, which is why everything looks so identical to CSS. And in terms of the font specification, you would have to rely on what's on the local system, much like you would with CSS. Yep, and then here. Okay. So you have the strokes first, and then you have the circles and the text. But it seems like the if that translates to having the strokes at the, at the bottom, and then the circles, and then the text at the Correct. Okay. So you're kind of building from the ground up, and you go down? Yes, so you'll probably get the best aesthetic results by putting the lines down, then the circles, then the text, so that as much as possible is visible. The catch is that you will still get overlays. For instance, the circle and the district lines on London's Underground uh, share a significant common subset, such that they each have a ring in the center of London, um, which is literally identical. One is blue and one is yellow, I believe, so the circle being yellow. Um, there is no easy way in SVG alone to make sure that you can see both. It took a human on the tube's real map to adjust those so that you see both different colors. You need not worry about such details. So. Uh, so it all has to do with the pixel locations. Um, because I'm using fairly large pixels here, and because the distance that these lines are running is not very long. So for instance, to take an arbitrary one like this, 359 going to 370. So that's only 11 pixels long. 255 to 249, that's only 6 pixels long. So because I've specified that those locations are what they are, by default, my screen currently, I think, is 1024 across, which means that we are, in fact, talking about locations over there. We've drawn it very small from the get-go. And we've not even take, we've ignored all this space because I've, imp I've indented everything some 400 pixels. And zooming feature is built in in the The zooming feature is a function of the player. So it's like scaling with a flash player. So all of these coordinates are relative, and they can be scaled. What you're really specifying is the relative distance effectively between all of these things, and it can be scaled infinitely. So, And there is a way, and I think in some of our smaller examples, if you look at them, there's actually a way of specifying in the root element the dimensions of the SVG itself. I've left that, I actually think I've left that out of all of my examples so that the player would just choose a default size based on the coordinates that it finds inside the document. But you can specify manually how big the, uh, the canvas should be, so to speak, and that would adjust perhaps for the size as well. Other questions? All right, why don't we take our five minute break then come back with FO and project two. We're back, and uh, here we are with XSL FO. So my goal here, at least, is to give you enough of a, a foundation that you'll be able to bite off what's expected of you for project two, um, but just realize that we're really just scratching the surface of this, and kind of I'll be waving my hand at some of the details, only because I don't think it's all that enlightening to understand. And really, this is a language I think that's certainly of great interest, perhaps, to those particularly interested in precise uh, layout of formatting information and so forth, but it really boil becomes quickly more of an aesthetic tool than of anything logical or XSLT-like in that sense. It's not really a language as much for programmers as it is for designers. So as such, we don't spend all that much time on it, but use it for what it is uh, good for. So in quick interesting history is that originally XSLT and XSLFO were one huge recommendation, and they eventually forked off the two into what we know as XSLT and XSLFO, otherwise just known as XSL. So you might call this XSLFO, XSL, or FO, whereas XSLT is the other thing. Okay? And the motivation for that, I'm sure, was several fold, one of which is that they're completely different conceptually. So there really was, uh, other than them being style sheet languages, that's about as far as the similarity goes. 
So what can you use these things for? Um, so XSL can be rendered or into or rendered with a whole bunch of different tools and into file formats. So what you'll be using in project three and four is a utility called FOP. And you'll use it very briefly in project two as well. And some of you have tried to use it from the listserv posts prematurely. Uh, so those of you who have had that experience like unrecognized prologue and header, it's because you're trying to generate a PDF from FO you haven't written yet. Uh, so please stop asking why the, your FO is not working. You haven't written it yet is our answer to every one of those questions. Um, but after tonight, you can write it. And we'll use FOP, which is another Apache tool, to render it as PDF, which is actually useful. FO is more of an intermediate format, as we'll see. So here's perhaps a simple example. Unfortunately, it doesn't look terribly simple from the get-go. But let's point out a few characteristics of this thing. So we'll tease apart in just a moment. Uh, one, the root element for, uh, for the first time is actually called root. Um, FO is the namespace prefix we'll use, and there's its unique identifier. So this stuff up here at the top of the file is sort of similar in spirit to stuff you might do with maybe uh, Microsoft Word documents, uh, page setup option, uh, and something like all this page maker laying out the sort of structure of the document. Um, but down here is where we actually get the content. So essentially, we are using these various elements, which we'll tease apart slightly in the slide to come, as to what this page should look like. And that's broken up into things called uh, pages and masters and regions, so to speak. Down here is where we actually have the content. So this thing called a page sequence is sort of like zero or more pages, so to speak, of content. It looks like within a page sequence, we have this thing known as a flow. So maybe similar in spirit to like a p tag or div tag in HTML, if that helps. And then a block tag, which is also similar in spirit to one of those. At the end of the day, the only thing this document is going to do is spit out hello world. So let's go ahead and take a look at, in our XSL directory, hello.fo. And we'll see the same file. But now let's take it one step further and run that fop command, where we'll see usage information once you've run that. And it's a little poorly formatted because of the size of my font. But if we scroll down just to the examples, you'll see that with a command like this, can you take in an FO file and output a PDF? So that's what we'll be using it for, at least for project two. So let's run fop of hello.fo. And we'll call the output hello.pdf. If all goes well, should just see another blinking prompt. In this directory, I do, in fact, have hello.pdf. Let's go ahead real fast. I'll leave this connection open for future files we might want to look at. 259, password, that's wrong. OK, let's go to, where am I? In my temp directory, pra examples, XSL, and hello. Ah, wonderful. There it is. There's our page. There's our hello world. All right, and with some default margins built in, given the default settings that we use. All right, so what more can we do with this, or what's interesting here? So and these quotes I took from the recommendation itself, just to give you a sense of what these sections are meant to be. So the master element, or the master conceptually, is the pagination and layout specification. So things like default margins and those kinds of things, the things that I didn't have to specify otherwise uh, explicitly manually. Flow, so the flow is describes the content that you're about to plug in to those one or more pages. Uh, a block is most similar in spirit to like a p tag. And it defines a block of text that you can exercise more fine grained control over. And then inline is sort of similar in spirit to um, maybe like the span element in HTML uh, or in XHTML so that you can actually modify a chunk of text without doing it inline, so to speak, without relying on it being a full paragraph of text, a full block of text from one line to another. All right, so let's look at these things in context. XML declaration, pretty easy. So the next thing, and this is that same input document just broken up, a little bit of a description as to what's going on here. So the root element, literally called root, is where we specified things like the namespace prefix. And inside of this is going to go a bunch more declarations, as we saw. Well, what were those? Well, we have this layout master set. And this is a, a wrapper, so to speak, for all of the different types of um, you know, formatting defaults that we want to use within the file. 
Well, what's one such thing? Well, we have this simple page master, uh, which I do give a name, my first, which I later refer to, which we'll see in a moment. And this thing is, um, uh, allow. this gives us more of that Microsoft Word analogy, where when you're using the GUI for Microsoft Word, you can not only type in the body, but you can go to view, header, and footer, and you have different conceptually distinct sections. This is sort of a way of setting that construct up. A simple page master has those different sections. I only took advantage really of the body, just to saw some content in there. And here is that content region body. This is a picture drawn from the recommendation that's more detailed than I think we need. But here can you specify things like the margins. And this picture, if you read it in the context of the recommendation, um, is meant to elaborate on what margins you're actually talking about. Margin top, bottom, and so forth. So again, some aesthetic details, which if you're curious, by all means pull them up, but I don't think are terribly enlightening to focus on, certainly for our purposes. But it's down here that we now actually had that content. So notice if you didn't before, that when I finally got around to saying, here's a sequence of pages, I specified essentially the formatting in which I wanted them presented, sort of doing this backward reference to those defaults that I had laid out, simple page master and so forth. Well, within that, I had this flow, um, which allows me to specify those different regions, uh, or different regions, um, which again refer to the, in the spirit of Microsoft Word sections, the footnote section, the body section, and so forth. And you'd have to look to a reference or the spec itself to know what these are a priori, but I'm just using really the main one the XSL region body, so the main chunk of the page. And it was finally in there that I had this block of text. And that's where we can actually put some actual content. Well, let's actually make things more interesting and actually provide you with some tidbits that can be helpful when it actually comes time to generate rel uh, real content, not just for the project, but for just in general here. So there is a way of expressing uh, fonts. Here's a sample, um, sample thereof. So here we have a block of text. It's going to be in red. It's going to be in the Times font, 24 point bold, font size 300. But notice here I just intermingled completely arbitrarily the inline element 2 so that I could demonstrate that LO world is going to be in all these settings. But the first letter, because of the span tag, is going to have its H really big. Okay, completely arbitrary example, but illustrates the intermingling now of the blocked element with the so-called inline element. And because I'm using inline here instead of block, it means that H is going to be on the same line as hello, or LO. So whereas in the world of HTML, if I instead put div and close div, excuse me, that would actually put H on the line of its own, which is not what we want aesthetically, presumably. OK, so some text properties. Long bunch of text here, but what's interesting is just the fact that there are these means of um, expressing things like letter spacing, which again is an aesthetic, text decoration, underlining things. But this is kind of neat, text transform, where you can actually rely on what are effectively built-in functions, if you will, with FO, that allow you to transform entire blocks or sequences of text by calling effectively the uppercase transformation. And that should force to uppercase everything between the open tag and this close tag. So again, just a, a hint of the kinds of things you can do with FO here. Um, tables. So this one is the most sophisticated structure that we in the course will at least introduce, only because it is kind of useful. And we'll look at a concrete example in a moment. Again, we're going to use in project three FO to generate uh, three or four PDFs. Uh, use FO to generate PDFs of purchase orders, receipts essentially. And we'll give you an example of a formatted receipt using a tab tabular structure only because in real world systems, it's presumably useful to be able to specify that kind of control over the aesthetic so that things are not as ugly as just my hello world example. So suffice it to say that similar in spirit to HTML, there are ways of expressing things like rows and individual cells and footers and captions and so forth. And this is just a depiction of the hierarchy of tags that exist for tables. And again, without dwelling on these kinds of aesthetics, what we'll do is take a look at an example. So let me actually go ahead and pull up order.fo. So in 
order.fo, and again, it's a little ugly because of the um, font size here, you'll notice that there is an example of a table here. And rather than walk us excruciatingly through this line by line, what I'll instead do is pull up the result of running FOP on this file, which is order.po, just to give you a sense, com project three and four time, of what you can do with tables. And this is an example of a document that was made with XSLFO, but clearly using some kind of table. And it's not all that complicated, but it's also, I would say, not all that interesting. It would be like teaching us HTML tables, which I think is, um, is certainly pick, uh, e uh, easily picked up on one's own. Certainly, if you have questions, um, ask over the list server in person. But this will be a nice structure that you can borrow from for that particular project. All right, so what about multiple blocks? Let's actually take a look at this uh, Jabberwocky example. So here's, it's a little small here, but we have the file as well, and I think it's among your printouts. So we have the same structure for this document, which is going to be ultimately called jabberwocky.pdf up here. Borrowed that from hello.pdf. I got this page sequence again. Now I got a flow name in the XSL region body, and now I just appear to have a whole bunch of blocks. So this time around, I have a document that, in short, is much more interesting than uh, hello.fo was. In fact, if we look at the results of running Jabberwocky through FOP, what I'll get is this PDF, which actually is pretty nicely laid out. So here, too, using fairly basic features of FO, can you do some nice formatting? And again, there's a lot of distractions with a lot of the metadata. But at the end of the day, we just have some nice verses here, separated by bits of gaps between the lines. But we got some italics up there, the title, and so forth. And we have this Alice Carroll, or Lewis Carroll poem here. Um, how can we have gotten to this point? Well, there's clearly some kind of structure to these verses. Right? They seem to be, you can imagine tagging each of these verses or stanzas with metadata in XML. And in fact, that's where this comes from. If we look at jabberwocky.xml, the source of this data is actually this. I mean, this is a perfect candidate for information that's really usefully tagged semantically so that you can distinguish the author from the title and the verse, one verse from another verse. So it might be very reasonable, for instance, for the author of a book on poetry to store their own poems in a format like this so that they can perform searches on it and that they can generate the same poems in a book version, maybe in a WAP version, maybe in a web page version. So I actually think this is a very compelling use for XML to tag things in this way. Well, what I did then, or what, I don't remember if I did this or someone else did this, could be some, let's assume someone else. Um, what we can then do is write a style sheet that whips up that FO, because clearly there's some repetition here, stanza after stanza after stanza. Well, in jabberwocky.xsl, what we have here now is an intermingling of XSL and FO. And I've just taken care to use different prefixes for the different types of tags to be ever more clear as to which is which. So notice that I've got my FO prefix defined up here to the namespace identifier that I had to copy paste from an authoritative resource. I'm matching on the root node. And then I'm outputting all this stuff, which is really just a copy paste of some of the canonical examples we've seen. But now it gets interesting. So notice that nested inside my flow here, I have apply templates called. Well, to what does apply templates get called? Uh, not quite everything. More specifically, <coughs> the children of of the root. Right, so by default, the select attributes default value or implicit value is children or child colon colon star. So what are the children of the root node? Well, just to go back to the XML file, it looks like a root of the document is it's a poem element. So I'm applying templates to the entire poem. So let's see what happens then. I got to scroll down. So down here. I seem to have a lot going on. Let's see if we can find anything for poem. So there's nothing to find for poem itself. But presumably, this code does work. It didn't just stop when it reached poem and said, I don't know what to do. Why is that? What template does, in fact, exist for the root element called poem? The default, which says apply templates to 
its children, which we've seen are things like title and author and stanzas, plural, and so forth. So let's take a look. Well, the title appears to be getting outputted as follows. And that, I think, was the first element in the file. So we're outputting a block in 24 point, aligned in the center, putting this amount of space before, uh, this amount of space after, retaining. So this is like the idea of padding versus margins, I believe, um, the value of the title. So in a nutshell, these few lines of code output the title and a bigger font centered the top of the page. Okay? That was just one of the children, though. The next child to be outputted, I believe, is the poet, the author. So here we have uh, italics. Recall that. Uh, text align at the end of the document, sort of justified on the right. Uh, how much space after? How much padding do you want below it? And just output the poet's name. So also pretty straightforward. Now we've got something slightly more interesting because we had multiple stanzas. Each stanza, or the stanzas, uh, when we reach stanzas, we're going to pull each of the stanza elements and we're going to output this. So this is how I gave it, I, I, I want to say I, I'm pretty sure I did write this style sheet, but it's been a while, so I don't recall. So someone wrote this and specified that we want to have uh, a bit of indentation and then nine points below. So this is how we got the little gaps in between each of the stanzas aesthetically. But then within this, I called apply templates on each verse. But for each verse, I just printed out its value. But I put it in a block so that it'd be on a separate line, each one, similar in spirit to the div tag. So the end result, and here we have an mixture, so to speak, of that pull versus push concept. We have the end result, which again is this. So pretty simple and pretty cool that you can use XSL now not only to generate HTML, which is perhaps getting pretty familiar, but yet another language, FO in this case, and also with Project 2, SVG, quite soon. Yeah? So in the stanza uh, template, do you, you replace the for each loop, the tool method, the Oh, sure. So down here in the stanzas? So absolutely, there is no reason that I couldn't have replaced these five lines of code here with a call to XSL apply templates and then define a separate template for a stanza element. Right, there's no reason I couldn't have done that. OK, so let's try this. So I'm going to delete these five lines. I'm going to put them outside here for just a moment. So here, what I'm instead going to do is XSL apply templates. And I'm not even going to put a select value, because by default, it's going to choose the children. And knowing the XML document as I now do, I know all it has is stanza children. And now down here, I'm going to define a template that matches stanza. And I'm going to have it. Do that. Right, because of the nature of apply templates, apply templates will select, will try to apply templates to all of the children, but it will do it in document order. The effect of which is to iterate from conceptually left to right over all the children, exactly as that for each would have. So if you're comfortable with this, by all means go with this. I personally still think that this approach is often more straightforward just because it's more clear, especially to someone uh, quite experienced in procedural programming, exactly what is happening, at least the first time you tackle this stuff. Yeah? A block in a flow? So you have multiple blocks within a flow. So the flow essentially describes, here comes all my content. And then it can be broken up into separate blocks. Mm, no, I believe that needs to be a child of, the, of that container for the actual content. Other questions? All right, so this here was our example of using XSLT. Uh, quite small here, but we already saw the real file. Um, so now the so-called big picture, just to put this into context. So what's really going on beneath, uh, underneath it all here is that um, when you have a source tree, uh, well, is this really that enlightening? Okay, 
So there's no need to dwell on this, frankly, if you've understood the flow of what's been going on. So if we take, for instance, our XSL document and apply it to an XML document, what you're really getting out of that conceptually is a new tree. It's the transformed version of the XML document as a result of applying that style sheet. If that result tree is itself in XSL FO, what you're really doing when calling FOP is passing a tree to the FOP processor, which is recursing on it, and knowing what it knows about all of those FO commands, like simple page master and block and inline, it is rendering them in the manner that the folks over the W3C have prescribed a processor should render it in. But what is important to note, and I think we said this last week, is that even though what you, the human, are constantly seeing is output to standard output and just flat files, ASCII text, really what's going on underneath it all here is just transformations of trees and turning one tree in memory to another. Just we humans sort of see things easiest when you dump it to a screen. But that's not necessarily the case, which is why I believe in FOP in Project 2. I think I walked you through the steps of running FOP both with the explicit XSLT transformation or doing it in multiple steps. But if you do it all in one, the processor can keep all of the trees in memory and slightly more efficiently go from XML to PDF because it doesn't need to serialize and deserialize each time or serialize and parse. So project two. So the guy on film a couple weeks ago introduced this project and last week I mentioned that uh, we really didn't do more of a code walkthrough because we were still focusing on XSLT. Let me just pull up xtube.svg. Whoops, wait, that's the output. Let me pull up xtube.xsl, which recall, and this is really just a testing harness. So we, for simplicity, or at least to automate these processes for you, put within XSL, within xtube.xsl, uh, the notion of a parameter that allows you to apply your transformation in XSL, uh, in SVG mode or XHTML mode. What I think you'll find is useful from a design perspective is not to implement your entire style sheet for the XHTML output in this file and then also your uh, SVG content in this file as well, but take advantage of things like the XSL include or import so that you maybe make a template call here, for instance, and a template call up there, but this way you can have two separate files, one for your SVG sty uh, style sheet, your XVG templates, and one for your XHTML templates, just so that this file is not ridiculously large and you have a conceptual uh, distinction between what uh, is being implemented uh, in each file. But up to you ultimately. We provide this really as a means of automating the building process. So at the end of the day, you are simply going to be applying your style sheets SVG mode to xtube.xml. And for this part of the assignment, will you take advantage of the fact that not only have we given you these XY coordinates for the GIFs, which are useful for the X HTML portion potentially, we've also given you these things called Eastings and Northings. And there's quite a bit of discussion in the spec as to how the whole OS coordinate system works in Britain. It doesn't really matter if you walk away with a perfect understanding of all that. It's meant really to be a, uh, a little aside as to how this all works. What's really important is the relative distance between all of these points. And one of the things I think we note in the spec is that if you are using these as your pixel coordinates, like the 530,000th pixel location, things are not going to scale or look very good. So clearly you're going to need to scale these very large values somehow. But they are important because they're relative to one another. But if you're curious about how other countries work with their geographies, that little discussion in the spec is hopefully somewhat enlightening. Okay, so at the end of the day, you're going to be generating for the SVG portion this thing, but for all of the lines. And it actually is kind of a cool thing once you've got it all working. And if you're feeling particularly industrious, a cool neat feature to do, say on the top of your document over here, or maybe over here is to put a fancy little legend to give yourself a bit more practice with actually doing some of the text, some of the lines, and actually positioning things in a nice readable fashion. But that is not required. Cool. Questions? Yeah? So my typical answer, if I know where you're going with this, is to assume a window screen of, say, 1024 by 768 and do it relative to that window size. Pick something reasonable so that um, there's no one answer to that question, but pick something reasonable.
So somehow scale numbers like 500,000 within 1024. So next week, I particularly like the direction in which this course now goes, which is transitioning from projects one and two to think from things client side to things entirely server side, where we're actually going to redeploy some of these same concepts and skills in the context of JSP and particularly Java servlet. So next week, we're going to look at things like HTTP and how it works, uh, what it means to have a session object in memory, how cookies are useful in this regard, um, focusing from lecture seven on out on implementing things on the server side. Project 3 will involve Wahoo, implementing your own portal, so to speak. Project 4 will involve implementing Scamazon, your own e-commerce engine with web service. Uh, so it's a particularly fun direction. And what you'll be using for each of those projects is Apache Tomcat, which is a very popular, if not de facto standard and free uh, application server, AKA uh, servlet container. So you'll also get a bit of experience um, launching it at the command line, configuring it, if you will, with different files and whatnot. So hopefully that too will be an applicable skill to exit the course with as well. Any questions? Yeah? I, I have a question going back to the simple SVG. Uh -huh. in, the, in the text for the, the textiles in that one group. Okay. Yes, so you could, yes, so I think I've, re yes, as you say, I've redundantly defined, I think, the font yes. size and or name. You could factor it out to the parent element. Okay. Yep, that would be cleaner, if only for file size's sake. That's it, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, some folks have used it in final projects, but for the most part now, we begin to focus more on Java, XSLT, um, and if XML schema, DTD, but again in a server context. Other questions? Yeah. It, it may be giving too much information away, but it, I, I think it's useful, it would be useful for me to have, um, say, a sample SVG output just kind of as a sanity check, but this is sort of what we expect your output. So I would look at circle.svg. So it's not just the picture I've shown, but the source code is within tonight's printouts, actually. So and that's very representative. And in fact, um, yours will look like that, but much larger, because you'll just have more data. Yep. This is just one. Mm-hmm. There are, I think, many others. Mm-hmm. I have not, honestly, got content videos of the project. Mm-hmm. So the geographic coordinates will take care of that for you as to the positioning of all of the lines and stations. Um, you will have a lot of things overlapping. There will be some lines that all kind of sort of come together like this, and it won't be clear necessarily because they're not going to look like this. They're instead going to be stacked on top of each other, but that's fine. So if you trust in the OS coordinates in the file, that's all you need to know as to where to draw those lines. You need to literally connect the dots. So yes, so in fact, this more sophisticated example of, SV, of SVG, I believe was made by someone in Illustrator. We took it from that URL there, um, but it was exported as SVG, specifically SVGZ, which just means a compressed version of SVG. Like, as, uh, I think it's gzip or uh, compressed. For, uh, and then you could ideally read, read the SVG. You could, but it's, it's a mess. It's like uh, saving a web page, making a web page with Microsoft Word and looking at its output, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what's going on in that thing. So. All right, well, let's adjourn officially here, and I'll stick around for questions.